morning, folks. Welcome to our Discovery class. We're so glad that you're with us on this beautiful morning. Hope you've had a great week. Uh, good morning, Carol. Good morning. And actually, you know, today we're taping is Tuesday. So tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. And we did not plan that oh. we would both be in green, but we are both in green. I so to, yeah. happy late. By the time you get this, St. Patrick's yeah, Day. I didn't even think of that. There you go. See? Yeah. That's where you got me. <laughs> Luck of the Irish the there. Irish. Uh, Kali Kalikimaka. That's Millie Kalikimaka. That's but, Merry but Christmas. But he's Bing Crosby. He's kind of the Irish guy. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Getting on to the lesson. <laughs> We're in Luke 18 today. Uh, continuing on with Jesus resolutely setting his face toward Jerusalem. Yes. And we've been on this path for several weeks now. We'll stay on it until uh, Easter Sunday morning. We're in Luke 18 today. We're just we're not going to cover the entire passage. We're going to be at the beginning of Luke 18, where Jesus tells the parable of the persistent woman. And then we're going to end chapter 18 uh, with the story of the blind man who receives his sight. So, uh, kind of book ending chapter 18. There's a lot in there. I encourage you to read it, but let's pray okay. and Carol will, will launch us off. God, we do thank you for this day, for the way you love us, for the way you care for us. Uh, God, don't allow us to miss the fact of your great love for us. And today, as we pray, we lift up uh, our teaching. We lift up those listening. We ask you to be with them and, and wherever they are this morning, ask you to bless them and encourage them. And as we always ask, may the words of our mouths and the meditations collectively of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. For your name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that, that if this calls this the um, parable of the persistent widow, we'd like you to think about the word persistent in both of these stories, okay? And um, the most, there's two very important lines in this. I'm going to start with one and probably let John conclude with the other. But the first line, 18.1, says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable, so we know he teaches in parables, to show them that they should always pray and, what does it say? Not give up. All right? And I think so many times, you know, I need you to stop right there because in Celebrate Recovery, we call it the push principle. Pray until something happens. You just keep praying. And I, I heard a thing the other day too, John, which, which I just really liked. Somebody, the the person talking on the radio said everybody always says there's three answers to prayer um yes no and later or wait and this person talking said i think there's a fourth one and i think it's greater i think it's greater than any of us would even know to ask for because it's what jesus is going to give us mm -hmm. so let's remember as we pray we want to be in his will and and i think that we want to be persistent in prayer john and and i think that mm -hmm. Part of John choosing the scripture that is walking us through to the cross is the word resolute. Mm -hmm. And resolute is a type of persistence. It's staying on course. So I just, I just didn't want you to miss that this morning because I think that that is so important. So then it says, in a certain town there was a judge. So there's only two people in this parable, a judge and a widow. And, and it says that the, the, he neither feared God nor he cared about men. Uh, probably not somebody I want to have as a friend. Not a very good judge. <laughs> uh, probably not. <laughs> okay, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. She kept coming and coming and coming. She did not give up. We don't know what the adversary was doing. <clears throat> we don't know what the situation was. We just know that apparently this judge was the one she had to go to. So let's let's just stop right there. Number one. Um, the, I said the widow and the judge. This was a very detached judge. And the judges back then were most likely appointed by either Rome or the, the, uh, by Herod. Okay? And so that they were being paid for things. And <coughs> most of the judges asked for bribes on the side. And then if you gave them a bribe, they would rule in your favor. Whereas if this... The Jewish people, if they had things that needed to be resolved, they would take it to the Jewish court, if you will. And there were three judges. There was one who would be for the plaintiff, one, one would be, you know, uh, for both sides, and then a neutral one. So you'd have three people deciding. With this guy, there was no choice about this guy. And it was interesting because I want to spell this out for you. In, in those days, they called him the Dana Gezgezeloth, and it's D-A-Y-Y-A-N-A-H is the first word. Second one is 
G-E-Z-E-L-O-T-H. And the definition of that is they were called robber judges. These mm -hmm. people were about making money and taking money. And so she probably, we have to back it up, as a widow, would she have had money? Probably not. Because when women were widowed, they, they were just in the home. So they did not have a visible means of support. And we know that there's so many scriptures about protecting widows and, and you know, mm -hmm. not to take advantage of widows. Exodus 22 has got a great one. But I want to read you just two short ones. Isaiah 117, it says, plead the case of widows. This judge was not pleading the case of the widow. And then the second one, which is my favorite, is John 127, which says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after or orphans and widows in their distress. So that God watches, God knows what's going on, but this lady was in a very disadvantaged state in front of this gentleman. He knew she was poor. He knew she couldn't pay him. He knew she had nothing to line his pocket, if you will, but she kept coming to him, and she kept coming to him, and she kept coming to him. So that this is one gutsy gal, if you will, because she knows that she can't play the game. She knows that she doesn't have what it takes to bribe him. All she has is her words and her persistence. And, and I just love that about her. She doesn't give up knowing she's the underdog and knowing he's probably going to rule against her, or, or she thinks that. Anyway, so that um, I'm going to let John now take uh -oh. the, the, the guy. See, I just love to do that. I, I caught him off guard a little bit there. Now, you take take the rest of the story. For okay. some time, he refused and go from there. Yeah, okay. For, yeah, okay. Um, he re, uh, let, me, let me find out where you're at. Verse okay. 4. Uh -huh. Verse 4, thank you. And, and it said, um, and there was a widow, and, and, and for some time, he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about people, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And can I just cut back in? See, I know she was one to cut back in, so I told that's why I was not Sorry. prepared. <laughs> okay, after I do she this. She tells me what she's going to say before she says okay, it. Okay, I'll so stop talking why. after this. Well, no, not really, but I'm going to say that. Um, keeps bothering me. The definition of that from back then is she's giving me a black eye. He feels that he's getting punched by this woman because she keeps coming back and coming back. And I think he's probably shocked that she keeps coming back because she can't play his game. Right. Now I'll pass it to you. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. But then I, I think then Jesus comes to the explanation. Yes. Um, and he said, listen, he, he, he asks three questions here. After, well, he says, first of all, he says, listen to what the judge says. And then, and then he, then Jesus, for the rest of the parable and explanation, asks three questions yeah. of the disciples. He says, "Will not God bring justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night?" And the answer there is a rhetorical, absolutely. Absolutely. God is going to hear the requests of justice from His chosen people, from us, those who have chosen to be His followers. God is going to hear our prayers. And then he asks another question. Will he keep putting them off? And the answer is a rhetorical no. God will not put you off. So, and, and then I'll just keep going. And I tell you, he will, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So he answers both of the questions. However, when the son of man comes, here's the third question. Will he find faith on the earth? Now I think what what I in, how I interpret this is Jesus is obviously saying uh, God is not like this judge. God is the complete opposite of this judge. That you don't have to be persistent. You don't have to keep begging and begging and begging. You don't have to have the monetary resources to play the game. God wants to, and God will come quickly in answering your prayers for justice. Period. I, I, I can't find a but. I, I, we've had this conversation before. 
I, I, I don't see anywhere in Scripture, and, and, and Carol disagrees with me here, but that's okay. I don't find anywhere in Scripture that, that God says yes, no, or maybe. Jesus always says God will answer your prayers. But he doesn't say the timetable. He, he, he says he'll answer your prayers. And so that's where I land on, on prayers to God, on, on seeking. I think, I, I, I think Jesus is saying here, persistence is good. He wants us to continue in coming. But our prayers, I, Jesus is saying, you don't have to be the persistent widow because God is not the unfaithful judge. God hears your requests, and he does give a timetable. He says, quickly. He says, quickly. Uh, and, but, but I think the point is, the point is that final question that Jesus asks when he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And I, and I interpret that as Jesus saying, when the Son of Man comes, he will come like the good judge, not the evil, the unjust judge. He will come as one who believes. He will, when he comes, will he find people believing, number one, that's who God is, that God is the faithful judge that answers quickly, and will he find people that are continuing not only to believe that that's who God is, but will continue bringing their requests faithfully to God on a regular basis. But I think that's what, and, I, and she's, I, I, I feel her chomping at the bits. I, I think that's, that's the point. Yes, exactly. We, play, we feed off each other. I think that's the point of the persistent widow and the unjust judge is saying that is not the economy of God. Okay, I just want to get back to the word faith. Because faith to me, thank you, You're John, welcome. is trusting mm -hmm. when I don't know the answer mm -hmm. and continuing to go to God in prayer Absolutely. changes me. He hears me. And, and, and I just have to say that thank even you. his son in the garden went to him three times persistently in prayer asking for an answer, which he got, which is probably not the answer he wanted because he uh -huh. knew he had to be crucified. But m my feeling is is that persistence in prayer means we keep trusting Absolutely. God during this. That we, our faith doesn't say, well, God, I'm giving up on you. Okay? Right. We don't lose hope. Hope is what we, what we hope for is, is coming. Um, and, and then just one other thing that I want to bring it to right where we're sitting in this chair today. Sure. Our church is in a, t in a time where we're in a big transition at this point in time. We've lost our senior pastor. There's a lot of change going on. There's committees being formed for a pastoral search committee and different things being on. We have a transition committee. If there was ever a time, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to be persistent in prayer, it's now. And, and oh, therefore, I would really invite a lot of you to come, if you would be and just come one time, to the prayer meeting on Monday morning at 9 o'clock. We pray from 9 to 10, just asking God's will in our lives and, and in our church. That, to me, shows persistence on the part of this church. And that that hour every Sunday uh, Monday morning, I know it's changed me. So I would express that invitation, but I would also say, if you're home, pray with us. It, you, doesn't have, you don't have to be here sitting in this building, but be persistent for this church asking God's will during this time. And I 100% I, I agree with that, 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 that I think what Jesus is trying to communicate to the disciples, because he was telling the disciples this parable as they are resolutely walking to Jerusalem, that you got to keep praying. Mm -hmm. You got to keep the faith, keep strong. As as Carol read it, that to show them that they should always pray and never give up. And and I think we miss the point of this parable when we say that I have to be that persistent widow and keep bothering God with my requests. When I think that's not the intent of the parable, the parable, the intent of the parable is to say, we need to remain faithful. We need to be faithful and never give up. But we need to realize that God is immediately, quickly hearing our prayers when we when we ask them, and that our prayers are in line with God's will. You know, I've, I've, I I I never was one to pray for a pony. I never wanted a pony. But I did want a 69 Camaro convertible. Uh, 
<laughs> and, a pony or a Camaro? And, okay. and, and I've never received one. Um, but 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 I think I think our prayers are deeper than that. I I I I, I say that tongue in cheek. That I've never actually bothered God with a prayer for a '69 Camaro convertible. But I have persistently prayed for other things in ministry and in life and my family, and 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 I believe God is answering those prayers. Is He answering them when I want? No, but I believe God is answering the, those prayers because I believe. God is unlike the, 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 the unrighteous judge. And God is hearing my prayers. Part of the praying process, I, I'm doing with, with another group, Exodus, and we just did all the plagues. <clears throat> and the question asked with this group was, why 10? You know, why did, why did he have to have so many? I mean, he could have just immediately killed the firstborn. And, and the, the consensus was that he was not only preparing the people, he was building Moses' character. Moses had to go back and Moses had to stay faithful to him with the Israelites grumbling and with, you know, even Aaron there. And so oftentimes not getting what we think we should get through prayer is really God's way of saying to us that he's building our character so that quite possibly then when the answer comes, we're prepared to handle the answer. Sure. Because sometimes he answers it as I was saying in the beginning, in ways different than what I asked for. Would you oh, grant me that? I, I will, Thank I you will very much. grant you that. I will <laughs> grant you that. I think, I think, yeah, I, you know, and, and I, I think the best thing for all of us in understanding the nature of God is, is parenthood. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times my girls ask for things that I lovingly know they didn't need, but I wanted to grant their every request. And, 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 and I think, I think again, God is that faithful parent that, that always wants us to ask. I think that's where the persistent comes in. That's where the, the never giving up comes in, that we continue this, this close personal relationship with God and realize that God has the very best intentions for me, not like the unjust judge, but as the righteous judge, as the loving, as the loving father, as the, as the loving parent, God wants the very best for me, and wants to provide it quickly. And and I and I will I will rest there. Why? I, and I I'll say that's what I think the image of the of this parable is teaching us is at the end, will the Son of Man find such faith? Will the Son of Man find people that believe wholeheartedly in the in the true nature of God? And will he find people who are continuing? to ask him and seek him, seek God's presence in their life on a regular basis. And I think that's what the third question answers. And the definition of faith in Scripture is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things seen, not seen. Amen. Okay, so that there's, there's the trust, there's the hope. The faith is that we continue on that road knowing that God has the answer even though we may not see it. There you go. Okay, all right. And so we, we're talking about... A, a parable that teaches us to persistently cry out to God for help, trusting that when we cry out to God for help, that God will hear us. And interesting that the chapter 18 begins with a parable that teaches those two things. And then we jump to the end of the chapter 18, where we see literally that parable fleshed out in an experience with Jesus. But let's just, before, we just want to know what's in between. Uh, mm -hmm. Two things that we're not covering today. Um, the, uh, he, Jesus blesses the little children, mm -hmm. okay? And so that that goes on. And then he's also down here, let me just <coughs> flip back through this whole thing. Um, and he also tells a parable of two men who prayed. So we're kind of skipping over things. But before we get into the 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 last one that I called the persistent beggar, and John and I have talked about that we believe that's what it is. He predicts his death for the third time right before this, okay? And a couple things, and he took the 12 aside and he said to them, we're going to go to Jerusalem and everything that has been written by the prophets, and he's, he keeps hammering that home, about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles they will mock him, they will insult him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. But on the third day, 
he will rise again. And the disciples did not understand, it says. Um, his meaning was hidden from them because they didn't know what he was talking about. Just, I just wanted to say a couple things. This is the third prediction of this. So it's not just like he said it one time. He says it three times for this, okay? And that, that seems to be, he does a lot of things in that are important in three times, okay? He also in this, he never talks about his death, but when he talks about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to focus them onto what is going to be ahead. And as John and I were kind of tossing back and forth earlier, there's certainly a lot of scriptures that these Jewish men had read of what we call now Messianic Psalms and Isaiah 53 and whatnot. But to them, they didn't, they didn't get those scriptures, but the, the scripture was standing right in front of them. Right. Everything that was predicted, that man was sitting there, and Jesus was saying, what they said is true, I'm, but I'm going to be resurrected. And three times, I don't think any of them got it. So, mm -hmm. it, and so that the yeah. persistent faith... I think might have also, and I'm going way out on a limb on this one. Go. Might have also. I got my been, saw out. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I'm going to get locked off, guys. Um, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night after he was crucified. I would just have to believe that some of those words were coming back to them that he said. And I, it, he, I just pray Peter might be thinking, is there a resurrection coming? I don't know. They were low. We call Saturday kind of low Saturday. It was just a low, low time for them. But his words had to have been tumbling around in their brains like a dryer, John. All these mm -hmm. things that he had predicted and he had talked about. He said he was going to be killed. Everything he said that was going to happen, he was going to be flogged and spat on and all these things. It all came true. That Saturday would have been a horrible, horrible day. And I just wonder where their brains were on this one. Yeah. And I, 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 I agree. I, I think I think let's not I, I want to be compassionate on the disciples and not be so quick to, to beat them up because they didn't sure. get it. Yeah. Because I think everybody didn't right. get it. And I, and I think I, you know I've referred to it before and, and, and I said, you know it's e it's sim not easy. It's simple for us to look back and see, oh, that's a messianic prophecy. That's a mess. Because we're, as I've said it before, and I, I think we're looking at it through our Jesus glasses. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, we, we're, we're putting these glasses on. And all of a sudden, we see all the strings kind of tying together. And it makes complete sense to us, to some of us. Uh, and, and, and I think there's still a lot of people out there that don't see the connections. But I think those of us who have experienced the Spirit have put on our Jesus glasses Believe that all these things speak of Jesus in the Old Testament. It makes complete sense to us. Uh, it's just like I'm reading a book now. Um, I, I, I've referenced him before by a guy named Michael Heisner. And, and he's going through Revelation, the book of Revelation, with, an un, with a desire to point out all the Old Testament connections. And it's fascinating. Just in three or four verses in in the first chapter of Revelation, he ties back all these images of references in, in the Old Testament that I would have never seen without him tying those knots for me. And so I think that kind of same mentality is happening with Jesus. Jesus can look back and we can look back and we can see this verse talking about him being arrested, him being denied, him being flogged, him being killed, him being resurrected. But the disciples missed it because they had not received the inspiration from the Spirit yet. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I, but but it, but it, the point is, the, Jesus, the point that I wanted to make today, that Jesus is once again saying, we're going to Jerusalem. Right. Let's not forget about this road we're on. Let's not forget about this journey that we're taking. And I think he, re, he, he reminds the disciples anew that we're getting close. We're in Jericho. We're about to enter into Jericho. Re, the only couple of places you can go from the roads to Jericho, and one of them is to Jerusalem. And so, guys, we're getting close. And I think that's, to me, why he brings that up. And so while he's on this road to Jericho, whether he's some of the other Gospels have him leaving Jericho, have him coming into Jericho, to, to me that's a non-issue. But on the road, he meets this gentleman who has been blind, who's blinded, 
uh, in Mark, he's referred Mark. He's referred to as blind Bartimaeus. Yes. And and so I think it's all the same guy. But the point is, he interacts with this guy who is persistently pleading. So just, but let's just back up a minute before we get into this, okay? Um, he, as Jesus walked along the road, it was very typical for itinerant preachers to be preaching as they walked, okay? So he probably had a group of people around him who were listening to him as they weren't just walking in silence or, or discussing the weather. It was a purposeful walk. As John said, mm -hmm. they're on the road to, to Jerusalem. So this was a purposeful walk. So he was probably giving them information as they would go along. And it was it was kind of customary and to be kind Somebody along the roadside would probably not have spoken out because he would be interrupting their teaching, all right? So that he, he, it was kind of the rules of the road, if you will, okay? And Jesus was talking. And they say to this blind, he hears. A group is coming. He can, you know, I, I think that when somebody's blind, I've heard that other senses become very acute. So his sense of hearing was probably very, very good. And so he says to somebody, um, what's, what's going on? And their response is, well, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Now, we just have to believe that he'd heard of him before. He may have even heard that he cured people of blindness. So that we, we don't get that detail. But he seems to know him because he starts calling out to him right away. But I don't want to miss what he called out. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, that's a very interesting title that he would have yelled out. He could have just said, mm -hmm. hey, I'm over here. Son of David, you have to go all the way back to Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. I just love that we get to go back to the Old mm -hmm. Testament. Aren't you excited? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and in Isaiah 11, <laughs> 1 through 3, it talks about that David would come from the stump of Jesse, Jesse being his father, David, and then it goes on. It's a messianic prophecy. So that we, when, when David is from the stump of Jesse, and it's, then, then the Messiah will come from that. When he calls out, Son of David... He is referring back to that Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. You can read that later on, okay? And he, and he starts out by, it says, he, he called out. And it would be kind of like if I raised my voice to call out to somebody. And he doesn't hear it. And I'm probably the people are going, be quiet, be quiet. He's teaching, you know, show manners. And then the second time, he, it says in the translation, if you look at the different words, that he screamed out as loud as he could scream. Imagine kids using their playground voices as loud as they could scream to get the attention of this son of David. And he says the same thing the second time. Son of David, have mercy on me. So he is just screaming away until he gets Jesus' attention. And Jesus looks at him and says, what do you want me to do for you? Go ahead, John. No, I, I, think, I think to me... Yeah, I, I think I, I, this man is a Jew. This man knows the Old Testament. He's not a Gentile. He's not a foreigner. He's not somebody from the other nations. He's obviously a Jew. He knows, he knows who Jesus is. He's one of those people that was able to tie some of those strings together, possibly. Exactly. Or, or he was just hopeful that this man that was passing by was the Messiah. Uh, I'm sure there was, there was hope that there would be people that would bring the salvation of Israel. And, and so he cries out to him persistently, as the woman did in the first of the chapter, uh, Jesus, have mercy on me. And then shout all the more, Jesus, have mercy on me. And then when Jesus responds, what do you want me to do for you? Um, I, I think he asks a very powerful question yes. that he asks all of us. And, and I think in all of us, we need to be able to have a as, as, as concise answer as this gentleman had when Jesus asked him the question, because I think Jesus is asking all of us that question. And, and I think, again, go back to the first of chapter 18. God is not like the unjust judge. God wants to hear our requests. God will respond quickly to our requests. And so Jesus is saying, what do you want me to do for you? I think Jesus is asking. Jesus is saying he's asking us that very same question. And we need to be able to have an answer. This is the gee, this is what I want. This is what this is what I would like you to do for me, Jesus, son of David. And 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 Jesus immediately responds to the man. Um, 
not tells him to wait. Doesn't, in doesn't, this situation, doesn't tell him no. He's already screaming for quite a while, so he is calling out. Doesn't, 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 it, 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 I'm, just, I'm poking, I'm poking. Uh, Jesus says, uh, replied immediately, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. And I think, again, referencing back to will, G will the Son of Man find such faith on the earth, that here is an example. Here is the opposite of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. Here's the, the truth of the parable in Jesus responding quickly to the man's one request. Heal me of my, give me my sight. And, and I Jesus just, responds. I just love the blind man's response when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Mm -hmm. He doesn't just say, give me my sight. He says, Lord, Lord, I want to see. So in his mind, he was bowing down. He couldn't see. Mm -hmm. I just love the, the kind of takeoff on this. The man who couldn't see could see who this was. He called him Lord. The other people, possibly Pharisees, we don't know who were listening to him, who could visually see, right. didn't know who he was. But this man not just says, a thank you, I want to see. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for coming over and talking to me. No, he says, Lord, I want to see. Isn't that the position we all need to be in when we bow down to him? And, and so many times in my quiet time in the morning, I just say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see what you have for me today. This man, what he asked for was definitely in the will of God. And Jesus saw that. He had that sincere heart. He wasn't, there was no, he wasn't trying to pull any punches here. He just said, I don't want to see it. It reminds me of the, the, a, a question that was asked one time before by James and John. Lord, will you do for me what we want? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what do you want me to do for you? This exact, same, exact question, same question. Exact same question. We talked about this Monday morning. Mm -hmm. And um, Jesus said to him, I don't have the authority to, because they said, let me sit one on the right hand and one on the left hand of you. When you, you know, come into your glory, they thought he was going to rule in the kingdom. I'm not trying to get... Side that was a no. But that was a no. Exactly. <laughs> and he said, that's not up to me. But same question. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do for you? And I believe that, that James and John were not asking for something in the will of God. This man is mm -hmm. definitely asking for something. So what does that say to me? That Again... I wouldn't ask for a Camaro, <laughs> okay? Mine was a Corvette. Sorry, I just didn't yeah, to <laughs> say. Let's be honest. <laughs> okay, um, I didn't get one. At any rate, I need to make sure that my requests, John, Absolutely. are in his will. So that when he says, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, make me more like you. That's what he wants to hear from us, John, I believe. No, I, I, I agree. And I think, I think it, it was obvious that Jesus healed this man in this moment. And, and he received his sight, and, and his faith made him well, and everybody around were, were excited and praised God and, and were anticipating the continued resolute walk to exactly. Jerusalem. Exactly. And, I, and I think that's, that's the end result for me of answered prayer is, is the life of a person who receives their sight and communicates that God has been faithful in answering their prayer and persistently lets other people know about it so that other people can, in the moment, praise God as well. I was going to say, and, and you know, when, when prayer is answered, so many mm -hmm. times we go right on to the next request. We right. need to praise him and thank him for delivering us or whatever the situation is. We need to become creatures of praise. And I think that's the other thing that this is saying yeah. to me. This guy didn't just say, okay, thanks, Jesus, thanks. I can see now. No, he, it says that, when all the people saw it, they also praised God. He was praising God, and everybody else was really happy for him, and they were praising God. So if, if you will, this was a worship service. It was praising God for, for what he had done for them. And the persistence in prayer needs to be followed by praise. And yeah. I just, I just, that's and follow so it because the man followed, continued yes. to follow after Jesus. He, he didn't go another way. He didn't walk back home. He continued following um, the one who had healed him, and that's and that's what we're, that's where we are to be today. And two requests, but both by outcasts of society, if you will, mm -hmm. sure. one a beggar, and one a widow, and um, 
they both got what they asked both for because of they... probably their persistence and also because of being in the will of God. Mm -hmm. Just says a lot to me, John. As, as I walk to the cross, and this is such a beautiful time of year for us if we just really ask him to reveal to us what he would like us to see during this time. Mm -hmm. Oh, how I want to be faithful Amen. and persistent and a creature of praise. There you go. With that said, God bless you. Thanks for being here with us. We'll see you next week. It's Palm Sunday. And so we'll see you then. Hope you have a great week. In the meantime, be wise, be safe, put your mask on. And be the church. Be the church. See you. Oh, there's a hand I can feel.